Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Sharla, for plugging my stuff. <laughs> I'm so honored to have you intro me. All right, so let me share my screen. Uh, hopefully this works. Da, 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 da. Okay, so I believe everyone's seeing my screen. Uh, are we good to go? Yeah, amazing. Okay, so hi, um, I am presenting on uh, Spice Up Your Charts or Spice Up Your Standard Charts, which is technically a title change from what it was before. It's a last minute switch up. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, and so I'm Yich Maraca, like Charlotte said, and I'm a senior data analyst at Kaiser Northern California's Division of Research. And that's my Twitter handle, and that's my personal website. And unfortunately, as a just in case, do need to caveat that while I am an employee of Kaiser NorCal, and I'm very grateful to um, be so, I am here as like a representative of myself. And so the opinions here do not necessarily um, represent Kaiser. And if the memes are really terrible or if my jokes are terrible, that's also not representative of Kaiser, just my not great sense of humor. So <laughs> let's get into it. All right. So initially, the presentation was going to be inspired by this book, Steal Like an Artist by Austin Cleon. Um, and this is a book that's cited a lot by a lot of like designers and illustrators and artists because it's all about how you can like take inspiration from other people that like inspire you from other things and bring it into your arts. It's really a way to like kickstart your creativity and rethink how you are creative. And I was like really excited to be like, all right, let me take pieces of this and like bring in data visualizations. But then something was happening at work and I ended up tweeting this and that's what really caused me to completely change this. So I'm going to like um, read out all tweets, like explain all memes and stuff like that, just in case there's anyone with visualization difficulties or visual difficulties. So it's a tweet from me. And I tweeted, I'm thinking as I write here, but I need a better calibration of amount of effort I should put in an internal work data visualization. I find myself often spending hours or days on a visualization that gets skimmed over. It's just not a good use of my time. And so I was having an issue where I was making great visualizations. I think they were bomb, not to like toot my own horn. I thought they were really effective, but I was spending so much time on them. And we talk about them for like, a minute, less than a minute. I'm being very nice to say a minute. <laughs> and what was happening was I ended up needing to create a new guide for myself whenever I was starting a new data visualization at work. And so I decided I need to always ask myself three questions. And the three questions are, what is my message? Who is my audience? And how much time do I have? And so it's how much time do I have to make the data visualization, but also how much time do I have to present it? Like, is it going to be a presentation where I'm one of 10 people? Is it going to be like a one-on-one -on -one meeting? Is it actually going to be more of a report? These are all the things that like I wasn't taking into consideration. And another part of this guide is like really thinking about this like very scientific chart where it's a picture of a chart and on the X axis is an arrow and the arrow is labeled time available in the workday to perfect your data visualization. And all the way on the left with the lowest amount of time is me, a data analyst, because I'm a generalist. Part of my role is to do many different things, including data visualizations, but unfortunately not exclusively them. And all the way on the right, who is a specialist and hired specifically for this are data visualization experts who have tons of time for this. And so here's uh, my first meme <laughs> or a painting, if you're not familiar with this. It's a painting of a pipe and it's labeled Cecina Potland Pipe, which means this is not a pipe because it's not a pipe, it's a painting of a pipe. And well, I am not a data visualization expert. And thus I'm not, really my role is to like 
use a bunch of toolkits to get things done. But really, if I spent eight hours in a day working on a data visualization, I kind of did something wrong. Like I have a lot of other things that I need to do. And so with that, the real topic of this presentation is tips to spice up your standard charts within specific time constraints. And why I didn't put that on the title slide is like, it's really long. It's not as fun as like spice up your standard charts, which in my head always makes me think of Spice Girls, spice up your life. So <laughs> let's get into it. So I have some time specific data visit, data vis advice, and it's like, for three different type of like time constraints or three different types of like time presentation constraints. And so what do you do if your deadline's tomorrow or today, or if someone like it's 9 a.m. and someone is like, hey, there's a presentation at one, can you throw some stuff together? And it's like, okay, all right, here's what you like really should focus on, which you tend to be able to get done in a short amount of time. And then what do you do if you have like a moderate amount of time? Maybe there's a couple days, maybe you actually have kind of like a whole day, give or take some hours, like work on it. And then what do you do if you have an abundance of time? For some reason, um, all your manuscripts are submitted. There's no new thing on your plate. And the only thing you can do is work on a data visualization. Here's what you should like focus on. All right, so if the time available in the workday is like the deadline is tomorrow, my advice is to start simple and then build up. Um, how I really like to work with a lot of data visualizations is like really start with the base chart and then just like add things to them in order to get closer and closer to my message rather than like start in the most complicated way and then reduce. But a thing to remember is that the more aesthetics you add to your visualization, the more complex your visualization is. So you kind of want to think about it as like everything you add, you need to make it worthwhile because you are adding complexity to your chart. But you always, so what you always want to remember is like your goal is as you're adding things is also for it to like be reducing redundancy. Are you adding something but then taking away something that maybe is also explaining the same thing? So always like reduce redundancy and add clarity. So all of these are super hand wavy, like great. What does that actually mean? And so, what you want to implement is your standard charts or your go-to charts. And standard charts, I really like the definition of standard charts by Lisa Charlotte Rost, who has an article slash blog post called In Defense of Simple Charts. And she defines um, simple charts or standard charts as charts you can create with simple charting tools. And because they are familiar, they're easier to read. So you can think of those as like your scatter plots, your line plots, your bar charts. Sometimes a pie chart, sometimes an area, a histogram, things like that, that everyone's like seen before. And thus it's like not um, super hard. You don't really have to do a lot of orientation to the chart, but then also you implementing the chart shouldn't be that hard for you either, because hopefully you've done it before. But why I put go-to chart is like, not all standard charts are necessarily your go-to chart. Like for example, I can never get a stacked bar graph right on my first try. Never. <laughs> it's just like, I don't understand why there's a blocker there. And so like, to be honest, a stacked, go chart, a stacked bar chart is never my go-to chart because getting it right and getting the labels right makes me so frustrated that if I am on a short time crunch, I'm like, I got to do something else. Um, <laughs> then you want to go with the non-default aesthetics because that'll make it more visually interesting so don't use the default colors don't use the default text text size text colors you're going to want to modify your legend and axes and then you're really going to want to hit the titles and the subtitle and caption subtitle and caption potentially being op optional because the titles and that area is where you're going to be like this is where my message is this is the point that i'm trying to get across with this chart and then the subtitles and caption is like additional caveats and additional information you may need to add. All right, so then the time available in the workday, say there's a moderate amount. Um, my advice is, well, first you have to do everything in the first one because that helps lay down your foundational chart. But then you want to start emphasizing the message that you wanted to get across. What are some additional things 
that you can add to your chart to emphasize that message. Mm -hmm. And then rely less on defaults and do more customization to make your chart seem a little bit more unique. And so things to implement, highlights. Um, so what I like to think of this as is like, they're usually in your title, there's like a message where it's like, things are increasing. And so you wanna highlight like, here's where it's increasing. So you, you like put a box around it, you draw an arrow to it, something like that. But then in order to call people's attention to that part of your chart, right? Yeah. But then by drawing their eye to it, you also need to explain why, are, why am I even looking at that? So you need to add annotations. Um, and then other things you can do are like atypical legends, atypical labeling, stuff like that if you have a bit more time. But a quick warning. So this is a screenshot of a tweet from Aaron Dataviz. And in the tweet is a picture of a pie chart and the title is Time Spent Creating Data Visualizations. And in the pie chart is, like 99% of the pie chart is labeled making labels. And like maybe 1% is collecting, cleaning, analyzing, and visualizing data. Um, I say this to like my friends and they don't really take, they don't really take this seriously. It's like with making labels, I either get it on my first try or it takes me three to six hours. Like there's really no in between. <laughs> and with that in mind, when I say like, do you have a moderate amount of time? Whatever label, whatever annotation, whatever highlight you're adding, really make sure the one you're adding is worth it, just in case you fall into the three to six hours <laughs> pit, like hole of time suck that making labels can happen. So I do think they're important, but I think the like constant shifting to get them right can take a lot of time. All right, which is why you should also remember when you're adding it, which is the shipping up earlier, is <laughs> reducing redundancy and adding clarity, where it's like you're adding labels to add clarity. Don't be redundant. Don't add like labels, just being like, this is where X equals one. It's like, okay, cool. They could see that. Um, why should they care that it's <laughs> where X equals one? All right, so then if the time available in your workday is an abundance of time, my advice is go wild, um, have a lot of fun, um, but have a backup plan. And so what you should implement is non-standard charts where you can lean into the data art field as a like really big caveat. I have never done this in the workplace. I only do this for fun because while I'm focusing on time constraints, the whole point about what is your message and your audience doesn't disappear. I'm often doing presentations for doctors. They don't want to see my data art. Like <laughs> when I'm talking about the results of a clinical trial, it's like, uh, like it's no, they don't want to see that. So um, <laughs> I tend to not really fall into this realm for work stuff, but for personal things. But still, I'll give you some advice. So you should also because you're doing non-standard charts, you're going to have to also do custom legends. Um, just because like you tend to have so many different geoms on there, so many additional aesthetics, you have to have a custom legend to explain what's going on there. And if I said labeling was a time suck, custom legends, ugh, genuinely the worst. Great, but the worst. <laughs> you may also have to do like multiple annotations. But with all of that, you want to create a table or standard chart as backup, because if you're doing this in a place where there's like a deliverable, say it's for work, um, what often happens to me when I'm doing non-standard charts is like, you can work quite a while on an idea, get to the end of it and be like, wow, this does not look great. And if you're pushing up against a timeline, you want to be able to have something else in your back pocket that you can like pull out and be like, but this does look great. So I would say your backup should be everything I talked about in the previous two slides. And you get those done and then you can like be more creative. All right, so let's implement my advice. Uh, but first, let's talk about tables. Um, I love tables. I think they're so underrated. <laughs> I, I use them almost more than I use visualizations to communicate stuff. And it's because of my audience and my and because of where I'm in for a lot of my projects where I'm not trying to convince anyone of anything, I'm trying to update. And I think the tables make a lot of sense when you're trying to like update certain people. And so tables are also a great way to show the individual values 
if that is kind of like where you're going communication wise. And they're easy to make if the data is already wrangled, which you have to wrangle the data for your visualization anyway. So like if you're short on time, maybe just, I don't know, show a table. So here's my table. And the table is from, the data is from the Urban Institute and US Census, but it was prepared for Tidy Tuesday, which is an organization run by Thomas Mock in R for Data Science, which cleans and prepares a data set every week for people to work with and create visualizations. And so this data set is about racial disparities in average family student loan debt. So it goes from 1989 to 2016, I limited it to only be the racial groups of white and black. And each point is the percentage of families with debt. And what you can kind of see in this table is that, okay, so there's always been kind of like a disparity going on. There is a gap between the percentage of, the percentage of families with debt between like black families and white families. And so that's what we're going to want to highlight in our visualization. So we're going to start with, um, the deadline is tomorrow, so we're going to do a standard or go-to chart. And one of my standard or go-to charts is an area chart. And I like area charts for this kind of data because it's nice for showing trends over time. And it's not a line graph. So like it seems a bit more spicy. Yeah, it seems a bit more spicy because it's not a line graph and we've all seen line graphs a ton. And then, but the default with an area chart is that it stacks. And I don't really love that it stacks because you can't really, I don't think you can compare super well when it's on top of each other like this. And so I am going to turn it into small multiples. I'm going to get out of the default aesthetics and like put in small multiples where the like, um, the percentage of families in debt that are black is on the left and the percentage of families in debt that are white is on the right. Then I'm also going to change the color. And I changed the color of the backgrounds from the default gray, because I don't like that default gray. And then I made it a blue and a green that's like a more muted color. Um, my advice for colors is it's really easy to go down a black hole with colors as well. So in your like free time, find a color palette, like, maker or generator that you really like, save a couple of them. And those are just your go-to color palettes. Um, yes. And then um, the next thing I did was I modified the legend and axes. So a lot of like kind of subtle things happened here. So I'm going to highlight them one by one. The first thing I, the first thing I want to highlight is the y-axis. So in the previous slides, it went from zero to 40. And I, I'm going to flip back. And I found that slightly misleading because technically 100% of people can be in debt. And it was showing, it was making these, the gap between these two points seem a lot bigger than it is. It is quite big, but it's not as big as it seems on this graph. And so I made it to zero to 100. And then I got rid of the label for the y-axis and I just added percentage signs here to make it abundantly obvious that these are percentages. I also made the zero actually start at zero. That is like one of my like biggest like pet peeves that for some reason the default isn't that. I think the zero should start at zero. <laughs> um, and I also got rid of the margins on the side so that the like area graph is actually covering almost all of the background. And um, I took the legend from the left and put it at the top because how I like to think about it is people read top down, left, right, right? And so I like my legend at the top so that you get pretty quickly what is the color, what do the colors in the graph mean? And then title, subtitles, and caption. So the title is Racial Disparities Persist Among U.S. Student Loan Debt Holders. And then my subtitle is explaining it. So it's like the share or percentage of families with student loan debt it's from ages 25 to 55 by race. And then I like to put down here where's the source of my data. So it's from the Urban Institute and US Census and it's prepared for or by Teddy Tuesday. And so this is like often a chart I will present at work. I'm like, this is good, this is clean, it's not misleading. It gets the point across. 
it is not also like the typical thing you see because I changed the font. I made it like, oh, I forgot to mention this. It usually is gray. I made it black. I made it a lot bigger so you can, I just really increased the readability. So if I was doing a presentation, I would do this and be like, oh, I'm totally happy with this because I'm going to be talking through it anyway. But say I have a bit more time or say maybe um, there's going to be like a report um, or it's going to be part of like an external presentation. I would then pivot. Oh, I went ahead. Let's compare. <laughs> I added the slide in the last minute and I forgot that I did it. So what we started at was the baseline. So like you can see where we started from and then kind of like our glow up on the right, like with a small amount of changes, this is like a really vastly improved chart. And so now we have a bit more time. We're doing the moderate amount presentation. So what are we going to start doing? We're going to start getting into like some of these things that help emphasize, but um, can be kind of difficult. So I want to highlight something. And what I really want to highlight is this point here and this point here. And these are at the same years. So what I'm trying to get at get across is this point that I noticed in the data that by 2013, um, like over 40% of black families um, had student loan debt. And during that same year, only like 28%, I think of white families had student loan debt. So that's like a really big gap. And I wanna like call it out specifically because that really like emphasizes this point that there are racial disparities that are persisting and exist but I think it's also not abundantly obvious in the chart that that is what's happening at these two points. So I made, I put a point there and I drew like kind of an arrow there. I never do the curved ones because I can't ever get the curvature right. And so I like to do the straight line ones. Not everyone's the biggest fan of them, but I rather do them to, than to mess with the curved ones for like two hours. And so I'm highlighting this point and then I need to add an annotation to explain why are you looking at this point. And so on the left one, I added the annotation by 2013, over 40% of US black families have student loan debt. Then when you look on the right, it's in comparison by 2013, 28.5% of US white families have student loan debt. And so calling, explaining what do, what are people seeing at this point or what is occurring at this point to explain why people are looking at it. And then the next thing I wanted to do was an atypical legend. And usually with atypical legends, I stop using the legends here. And then I just start doing some like direct labeling. And luckily for this one, it wasn't that hard. And what I did was I got rid of the legend at the top and then I just put it on the area chart. So you can see that like, these are black families and these are white families with student loan debt. And I think that's it. Yes, I think that's it. And so <laughs> on the left is the deadline is tomorrow chart. And on the right is the like, okay, we have a moderate amount of time. And it's really funny when I created this presentation, I was like, wow, these don't look that different. But this literally just figuring out the best way to annotate this and adding the annotation and getting it aligned took as much time as creating this chart. It was frustrating, but it was, I still like it. I think it looks so much better, but, <laughs> but it's a thing to be aware of. And so we're not going to go into the abundance of time chart because I did not have an abundance of time to like figure out how to do a really fun data visualization for it. And so we're going to end here where I feel like we spiced up our chart. Um, also for people with um, visual difficulties, it's Spice Bay. <laughs> And he's thrown some spice on our chart that we made. Um, and so I hope that with these tips, you feel equipped to spice up your chart. And also knowing that like adding, adding spiciness, adding flair to your chart really isn't, is really an act of like, how much time do you have? And thinking of all the like advice I said, and then just really going through it one by one and adding those things until you're like, okay, this is good. And then you just kind of stop <laughs> and you like let it go. All right, so whoop, thank you for attending. Um, this is my Twitter handle and 
the um, slide, the link to the slides, and also all the source code for the slides. If you want to recreate any of these charts, um, is available at this GitHub link. Oh, it's not link. GitHub repo. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ajmako. Really appreciate it. Um, it was just amazing. Uh, the first question that we always ask is, uh, do you have any books that you recommend? And um, while you're while you're thinking about that, so we'll record that answer, and then after that, we'll turn off the recording. And mm -hmm. if folks have any questions, uh, they can just raise their hand, and then I'll call on you. I would ask that you just briefly introduce yourself, um, just one sentence, so that we've got some idea who, who we're talking to. Um, but yeah, do you have any books that you recommend for folks? Yeah, um, so I really like, so first I should caveat, I'm not a really heavy uh, nonfiction, any type of nonfiction reader. Um, and so I'm going to recommend books, but then I'm going to recommend something else. So I really, I always have on my desk or near my desk, John Schwabish, Schwabish's new book. Um, what's it called? It's literally near my desk right there. Um, Better Data Visualizations. Um, I really like it. Um, I think we align in thought about data visualizations, but I also really like it because he delves into so many different types of data visualizations by kind of like, what are you presenting? So I find that really useful for when it comes to, all right, I just want to kind of do something else. I have a bit more time. And so I like flip through it. I'm like, oh, I forgot that type of chart exists because I'm not I don't have a great mental Rolodex of every single chart. So it's really nice to be able to see an example and be like, oh, okay, I'm going to implement this idea. Uh, I like, um, I think it's called How Charts Lie by Albert Cairo. I think everyone recommends that one. Um, I really do recommend Steal Like an Artist um, because I really do think um, there are some ways to implement creativity into your data visualizations without going super deep into data art and I think steal like an artist also could be really helpful for when it comes to like stealing like an artist from other data visualization people. Like, what do you really like about things? Like, for example, the like arrow thing I do, I took that from someone on Twitter called Jake Kopp, who does it like in a different way, but he made me realize like, you don't have to use curved arrows if you don't want to. And that was really nice. Um, then broadly, because I don't really like to like, um, I only really like to read fiction romance novels, to be honest, but um, <laughs> um, other ways to learn is I love interviews. So I love if people do like podcasts, if people do um, more like written blog post interviews and type things. I really love learning from that. It doesn't really like teach you necessarily like this is the best way to put this, but it really helps um, understand how people think about things and how they approach things and you get additional information like that. So I'm a big fan of like interviews. Like if someone says they did an interview, I read it immediately. It's always a really good time. 